The Democracy That Delivers podcast is brought to you today by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SIPE. This is the podcast where we talk about corruption in its many forms. And now to your host. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Center for International and Private Enterprises podcast, Democracy That Delivers. This is a special edition brought to you by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SIPE. My name is Peter Glover, and in my role at SIPE's Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, I lead our Anti-Corruption Rapid Response Programs. Today, it's my pleasure to be virtually sitting down with Egyar Lizundia. Egyar serves as a Deputy Director for Technical Assistance at the International Republican Institute's Center for Global Impact. In his role, he's responsible for overseeing the development of programmatic approaches that seek to make the Institute more effective at tackling challenges to democratic governance. And he's one of uh, our main contacts there on anti-corruption programs. Egyar has always been a generous collaborator and a willing sounding board. And I wanted to talk to him today because he always seems to have one foot in the implementation of anti-corruption programs and one foot in the larger debates and questions about how to make these programs more effective. I also know that he has a lot of important insights into anti-corruption rapid response, and I wanted to dig into those a bit. We'll link some of his recent publications in the show notes, but he's recently written on topics such as bringing local governments into the Summit for Democracy, promoting good governance in Central America, and looking beyond the West in the effort to combat global kleptocracy. Over the past few years in my job with the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, I've been leading a series of anti-corruption rapid response projects in countries like Sudan, Armenia, and Ecuador, where political transitions or major scandals have opened windows of opportunity for reform. And this podcast is part of a mini-series that touches on rapid response programming. But first, before getting too deep into the weeds, we'd like to hear a little bit more about you, Egyar. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at IRI, and how you came to be in that role? Hi, Peter. It's great to be with you and with the SAIP family. Uh, it's always a pleasure to find uh, ways to collaborate and to engage in important conversations. My role at IRI, well, you described well what I do, but the way I like to present it is that I'm responsible for helping IRI deliver better programs. And what that means is making sure that our interventions are based on the best available evidence as well as informed by tested practices, things that have worked from different contexts, but also by innovative approaches and interesting and emerging ways of of doing things. So in that regard, I oversee several technical practices, but perhaps the one that I most focus on and definitely the one that is closest to my heart is the work that IRI does on anti-corruption. So it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about anti-corruption in the context of rapid response and windows of opportunity. Great. I'll just jump right into the topic. And so can you tell me a little bit about how your view on the importance of time sensitivity and seizing windows of opportunity for anti-corruption programs has evolved over the past few years? Are there specific experiences, either in projects or outside of projects, publications, you know, specific individuals that have helped shape this this evolution, if there has been one? Yeah, absolutely. I have to, or I have come to realize that the windows of opportunities for anti-corruption or for meaningful reform that tackles the drivers of corruption are not only presented when there is a political transition, either at the regime level or in government, or around the passing of key legislation or other context-changing events, COVID being the most recent and dramatic example, but they're also created by having the right people in the right place. And this can mean great reformer uh, who's a civil servant and happens to be entrusted with some degree of authority or a key process that traditionally has had corruption uh, vulnerabilities. Let's think about the people entrusted with overseeing public procurement. When you have the right person there who's willing to perhaps just pick one area where some meaningful change can be done, that is creating a window of opportunity. I feel like sometimes we think about this um, as almost seismic events or, or earth-shattering 
changes and transitions uh, when we're talking about how to seize the momentum for anti-corruption. But when you go down several levels and narrow down the focus of your anti-corruption work, you can actually find that there's multiple wins of opportunities. In terms of literature or publications that have shape my thinking and the way I, I approach this subject. There's one recent research paper that comes to mind by Gersovic, Gatoni, and Algoso from the Open Society Foundations. I believe that you might have them come to the program as well. And this is on how global actors can better support anti-corruption reformers. And in the, the research is quite illuminating in terms of the definition they employ for windows of opportunity, which you know is a, is a term that we, we throw around often, but it is important to have a definition for it and sort of like the sequence laid out. And also the recommendations they have for external organizations like IRI and their focus on um, reformers on the ground being the most important actors and how the rest of us, if anything, can play a supportive role and that requires doing up our homework, so to speak. But in general, the two most important influences in the way I approach my thinking about how to address corruption are, first and foremost, the work by Professor Alina Mungiu-Pipiti, whom I know is a, a great friend of SIPES, and the, teaches, the teachings as well of um, behavioral science research. In terms of Professor Mungiu Pipiti, she's just amazing. I have learned uh, so many things from her view of the field and why it's so hard to make progress in fighting corruption. Perhaps the, the two most interesting takeaways from her work, from my perspective, are how corruption is not a deviation, but the dorm. Ethical universalism is not a given. It is something that is the result of a very peculiar historical evolution. And in fact, there is no country that is corruption free. There's some countries that are better at controlling it, but there's no country that is completely uh, impervious to corruption. And related to that, she also makes the point that in order for anti-corruption efforts to be effective, you need people with skin in the game to be involved. So you should be targeting in terms of who you support, those who are not necessarily professionally involved in the anti-corruption movement, um, folks like you and me, for instance, but in country, those for uh, those business owners uh, for, uh, of small um, shops that might be tired of having to pay bribes to the local police and actually can be mobilized in order to promote change because it is so existential to them. And then in terms of behavioral science research, I just think that it's a very uh, interesting and unusual way of doing public po uh, policy, uh, period. Humans are not fully rational and we can be nudged into behaving more ethically. And I think that's a very promising area of work. Great. I have a couple follow-up questions on that, if you don't mind. The first is right early on, or the, the first thing that you talked about was coming to view micro windows or, or sort of much more con contextually driven windows of opportunity as being really important. And so that to me raises the question of how do we as as folks, you know, sitting in, in Washington, DC or, or wherever, you know, who aren't immersed in the in a in a country context on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we do a better job of of identifying and understanding when there is like a relevant micro window of opportunity? My recommendation is always to make sure that you are working with people on the ground that might have access to that information. We are lucky, uh, SAI, IRI, uh, to have local offices in many of the countries where we operate. And that is uh, a great asset that, that we have as, as institutes and as part of the, of the NET family and tapping into our colleagues and fellow um, anti-corruption specialists who are very close to that reality, who have that regular interaction with civil servants, government officials who have access to the local news and who are much more able to spot who actually might be a genuine anti-corruption champion and reformer and is doing it for the right reasons. We have several examples at IRI where we've been able to do work at the municipal level precisely because we um, receive that critical information and those key insights from our colleagues. And then based on that, we were able to conduct um, more targeted assessments that are able to identify the existence of political will and, and, and of this window of, of opportunity. So that would be my um, suggestion to, to really rely on, on those who, who have this granular and really uh, context-rich knowledge. And I think one, maybe if you don't mind drawing out like one, one idea from that is also the importance of sustainability and sustained engagement 
even before sort of a specific window of opportunity opens, the idea is that you need to be you need to be able to understand within context sort of what really is a window and what isn't, and you need to have those relationships sustained over time. Would you say that's sort of accurate? And I, I think that both SIPE and IRI as as sort of as organizations that receive funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, at the very least that type of funding gives us that ability to have those sustained relationships and sort of certainty and, and security in, in our programming. I couldn't uh, agree more. And one key element of, of sustainability is the development of trust. And developing trust obviously takes time. So to your point, I think that having that sustained presence that our uh, our membership to the family or, or our um, sort of history as, as core institutes for us is key because our partners, when the moment comes and when there is momentum, know that we've been there, know that we, we care about the issues that they care about, that we don't have a, our own agenda, but we're there to elevate the efforts to promote democracy and anti-corruption work in this case. And that's that puts us in a better position to be able to mobilize the resources that these actors might need when there is a window of opportunity. Thank you. And then, and then one other piece on the on the Alina side. I know that a lot. Right. Some of the implications from her work is the importance of thinking about things from a bit of a collective action perspective and and looking at ways to bring together different groups of actors. And that again sort of has programming implications that I think are really interesting to unravel. But but maybe if we have a little bit of time at the end, we can come back to that if, if that's okay. So my next question is, can you talk about specific example of IRI rapidly responding to a window of opportunity for anti-corruption reform? And can you sort of talk about how this program might have differed from other sort of bread and butter anti-corruption programs? Absolutely. Perhaps a good example is our recent follow the COVID uh, money in the Gambia. Um, for IRI, this was very new in the sense that we have never um, operated a, in a pandemic scenario. And thus, um, we had to pivot quickly and uh, shift our focus from more long-term fiscal transparency reforms to looking at how uh, the funds that were being mobilized to uh, respond to the crisis were being utilized. So when COVID-19 hit, the Ghanaian government, just like governments all over the world, responded with specific funds uh, and programs to help alleviate the burden on citizens. And immediately uh, what we did, uh, thanks to funding from the U.S. Embassy in Banjul, was to collaborate with a partner that we had uh, been uh, working with with a long time, Gambia Participates, to look at this, to look at how this money was being spent. And eventually, our partner, Gambia Participates, produced a report that highlighted essentially the government's uh, mismanagement of the crisis from a financial operational uh, standpoint. One of the key things that the report that they ended up producing revealed was how millions uh, of dollars had been spend on things like motor vehicles, hotel accommodations, while the clinics and the treatment and isolation centers were in, in not uh, adequate conditions. What was surprising, though, is that the report and these findings produced a response from or, or triggered a response from the government, and, and um, they committed to look uh, into the matter further. So what we uh, proceeded to do was to dive deeper into the tracking of, of the funds specific to uh, COVID programs, and then work to popularize and share the information uh, publicly in the Gambia, both in English and, and local languages, uh, by using social and traditional media platforms. We have a team in, on the ground right now working on this, um, deployed across the country, and they regularly collect data. And this can include the delivery of, of food uh, uh, packages, which is very important for the Gambia since the pandemic has threatened uh, the, a lot of people's livelihoods, and see whether those are getting to the right um, beneficiaries. So the project's still ongoing, but in the next few months, we should have interesting data that would complement that initial report that our partners uh, produced. And one of the challenges of this exercise was obviously accessing the, the information about these COVID-19 emergency funds. And the perhaps ironic thing is that it was harder to get data on the funds that multilateral organizations had pledged and provided the Gambian government 
than it was to actually look at the, the domestic um, resources that were being mobilized. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember sort of not too far back, but right, that there were all kinds of issues around around international international funds around COVID-19 and, and the, the difficulty in tracking and the maybe the absence of strings on those funds around around monitoring and sort of ensuring that they were getting where they were supposed to be going. Um, I think to me, one thing that's really interesting is, is the fact that it actually resulted, that the program actually resulted not just in you know, an organization, a, CS, a civil society organization in the Gambia, putting out information that was critical of of something that the government was doing, but that that actually had an impact on on the way that the government behaved. And I I wonder if you have thoughts on on why that happened, because I know I know that right around the world you'll have civil society organizations publish critical reports of governments all the time, and and governments may just completely ignore them. And I wonder why you think. It was a little bit different in this case. I'll go back to the idea of the window of opportunity. I think that luckily, um, perhaps rather unexpectedly, or at least uh, this is not something usual, we see that the window of opportunity in the Gambia to do this type of work and to achieve and promote meaningful anti-corruption action is um, particularly long. They um, had their revolution, their, their change of regime, their transition to democracy only Four years ago, uh, but that's a long time when it comes to uh, windows opportunities. And, and uh, the report I was mentioning earlier, I think that outlines a shorter lifespan of those moments where anti-corruption reform is possible. One reason for this is that following the transition in the Gambia, the political class was entirely new. Uh, you didn't have a lot of members of the old guard. Uh, hang around. And a lot of the um, members of the National Assembly and other key figures are um, young and really eager to see change in the Gambia after so many years of of dictatorship and and poor governance. So we've seen meaningful progress across the board. And the challenge here is how to make sure that we can sustain this momentum uh, or support the Gambians themselves sustain the momentum and keep this window of opportunity open. Yeah, and I think I think it's really. I mean, in the context of the of the transition in the Gambia, it's almost impossible to imagine this same type of work happening prior to the to the revolution. And I think that the ability of a civil society organization to be critical, and then the the willingness of the government to not just you know tamp down and to and to react, but then also to to be open to and, and listen to the report shows how much has shifted in a relatively short period of time. So I was wondering if there are any other examples that you would like to highlight, you know, uh, of rapid response programs from IRI. Um, in other countries? Absolutely. Two countries come to mind, North Macedonia and Mexico, uh, different regions, different, uh, obviously, sizes, dimensions, problems, histories. So let me start with North Macedonia. There, I mentioned earlier how a change in government uh, creates a window of opportunity, and that was the case for the work that we have been doing on the anti-corruption front in North Macedonia. In 2017, after 11 years of rule of the previous party, a new government was formed, and IRI supported two key initiatives, an open finance portal, as well as a revision of the anti-corruption law uh, as it was written at the time. The specifics were a bit different in the case of the open finance portal and, and the law, uh, but to start with the with the portal, this was actually a, something that had been proposed uh, in the electoral platform of the Social Democrats, uh, the party in power. And in 2018, they um, came to us asking for international support in its implementation. So what IRI did was to help them connect with software developers to help develop the the high-level requirements to make sure that the portal was not only technically sound, but also responsive to the standards and to the criteria for uh, this type of portal. And also that it included most critically, the views of citizens and journalists, the end users of of the portal. So we didn't want to support the development of something that would just be a box-ticking exercise, but rather user-friendly and meaningful tool for the users or the the final users to uh, take advantage of. 
In terms of anti-corruption law, the mechanics were a little bit different. This is something that actually we recommended this based on our assessment on, on the existing legislation and also our uh, work for the last few years uh, on the ground. I mentioned earlier how important it is to have this long process on the ground and the local expertise that can actually identify what are the, the needs. And this is what uh, we did in this, in this case. So we presented the idea to the prime minister and he instructed his party to start the process of amending the existing law, which we, uh, again, supported by mobilizing experts on, on different aspects of the law and sharing best practices. Two key reforms that the law um, introduced were first a public and transparent uh, as well as merit-based process for selecting the members of the North Macedonian Anti-Corruption Commission. And this was very critical because it was the first time that that type of open selection process had been implemented in any of the 173 public bodies in the in the country. And second, the new law uh, also strengthened the powers of the commission and its position in the chain of institutions responsible for combating corruption, giving it the tools and the instruments to really enact anti-corruption measures and, and to have some some teeth. So today, the power of the commissions have, uh, or the powers of the commission have been significantly strengthened and the commission oversees things like party funding, election campaign, financing. They can investigate bank accounts of public officials under suspicion, and they can even issue fines to, to individuals that are not in, in compliance. Shifting to Mexico, there the work was a little bit different, uh, and also the window of opportunity uh, differed from what we saw in North Macedonia. Here, it didn't have to do with a change in government or an event happening, but what occurred was the passing of a landmark piece of legislation, the National Anti-Corruption System uh, at the federal level, which for the first time created a series of institutions and frameworks that collectively were aimed at stamping out corruption by taking a really multi-sector approach at how corruption happens and also mandating states to develop their own anti-corruption mechanisms. So that's exactly what we did. We partnered with three Mexican states, Querétaro, Coahuila, and Nuevo León, and helped form and sustain anti-corruption coalitions that included several stakeholders. Not only folks from government, the media, CSOs, but also the private sector and academia. And this effort was a little different from what others were doing at the time, which was more geared towards monitoring the enactment, if you will, or the rolling out of these state level uh, anti corruption systems. We decided to take a different approach and instead having local actors tell us what, what they wanted to do. Um, and out of that dialogue and, and engagement, this idea of supporting coalitions of, of multi-stakeholders came to fruition. And um, in the end, um, we are quite satisfied with the results because when you look at the, the systems that these states ended up establishing as mandated by the federal law, they include much more innovative components and also they are much more open to addressing the local needs of the states, as well as the difference between the main types of corruption that you see at the subnational level in Mexico, which have more to do with petty corruption than what you see at the national level, where the main issue in the eyes of, of the citizenry is, is these grand corruption scandals. So by supporting a, a locally driven effort, we were able to help shape anti-corruption efforts that were responsive to the needs on the ground and not trickle down from the center or, or an external organization um, like IRI. These examples, I think, they're really excellent examples. And I think that one thing that they do combined with the Gambia example is that it raises a whole slew of different questions that maybe we won't have time to get to today, but but perhaps we could discuss in the future. But a lot of it is, for me, the questions are about targeting and thinking through where to locate, you know, anti-corruption programs and support for anti-corruption efforts during Windows of Opportunity, you know, be it with the public sector, the private sector or the civil society, central government versus local government or even or even municipal government, whether to be targeting specific individuals or laws or to be trying to work, you know, more from a, 
a base building or, or multi-stakeholder perspective. And I think that these are all questions that both echo back to perhaps some of the some of the work of Alina Mandrupipity that you mentioned earlier, and even some of the behavioral science work out there. But then it it also it has really concrete implications for 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 anti-corruption programming. And some of these decisions are, are really difficult to make when when there's not a lot of time, when things are time sensitive. And and so I think that again to me brings us back to the the point earlier about the importance of sustainability and trust with with relevant local actors. I think that that's like a conversation thinking about that targeting is a conversation that that needs to get drawn out a little bit more and I, I'd love to continue talking about it but I do have one last question for you which is IRI recently published let me get the actual name but the the anti-corruption toolkit for civic activists and and I really appreciated it and and really liked reading through it which is I don't always love reading through toolkits but I liked it because it felt like it was practical and easy to read and easy to use, like you could pick it up and without too much time, go from reading this document to making, taking actions. And I thought it was, we were really interested in it because it felt, it felt like it could be used in contexts where people don't have a lot of time uh, to sort of dig through multi hundred page documents from, from different international organizations and to figure out the right next steps. And it has the potential from our point of view to cut down on the time it takes from sort of providing guidance to actual actions. Can you talk a little bit about why IRI decided, and, and at least my perception is that it was a, a, an intentional decision to focus on accessibility and ease of use as opposed to you know, technical depth? Absolutely. And first of all, thank you for uh, the kind words uh, about uh, our toolkit, uh, as you noted, is one of the resources that we, as I write, have produced uh, to support the work of civic activists to address corruption. And absolutely, the idea behind it was to make it easily deployable and also modular. So it has three main components that are supposed to be followed in order. If you're starting from scratch and you want to have the, the full... Um, to follow the full theory of change behind it, but they can also be taken separately. And the first one is research methods and security, helping activists who are interested in exposing corruption to be better equipped to do so and to have access to some of the, the methodologies out there, but also doing so in a safe manner and in a, a way that doesn't do harm um, and, and put them at risk. The second one is on collaboration and advocacy, which going back to the idea of collective action within this critical, you need to have a, a wide platform, a strong coalition in order to be able to be successful in the anti-corruption space. And lastly, the third model is on communications and the media, because as we know, the, the messaging front and, and how to get your, uh, your platform and your agenda um, to be shared by a broad a swath of the population requires having some, some basic skills that the toolkit also uh, includes um, information and practical tips on. But to your brother point, we agree that there's a lot of guidance out there, uh, but the challenge is um, often to ensure that folks have access to it and can utilize it as quickly as possible. So uh, we've been trying to get the, the toolkit in the hands of as many people uh, as possible. We've seen it being utilized uh, in Iraq, the Maldives, uh, in Mali recently, and our team in Albania is currently deploying it as well um, for a project that actually IRI, SIPE, um, and uh, NDI and IFES are implementing together. Egier, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and perspectives, experiences, and insights. We're going to share all the relevant links today in the show notes. And I want to say thank you to Zoe Watkins, our producer, and my colleagues, Holly Sandalo and Ali Monroe, who helped make this episode happen. And uh, thank you again, Egier, and until next time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.